Well, welcome. We're really glad you're here. Uh, we met last week or two weeks ago and did some preliminary things. So, uh, most important piece we're going to be working on for uh, the immediate future is the scriptures. And we gave you a study Bible. So, uh, the, that's going to be the, if you will, the the textbook for the two years of confirmation and that's yours you get to keep it and you can do whatever you want with it uh, you can cover it in stickers you can write in it you can underline it um, there's a he's dead now he used to be a professor at the university of chicago named mortimer adler and he wrote a book on how to read a book and he said that you should own it and underline it and write things in it. And uh, the idea is that you're having this ongoing conversation with whoever the author is. So uh, we wanted you to have a good Bible. And we're gonna show you some things today about how that thing's printed. Uh, the first piece about scripture is it's a, a library. and. Uh, that seems simple to say, but uh, it's a really important concept. Because if you, if you look at it, here's my Bible, and it looks like a book. And it has table of contents and index and things that you see in books, right? But that's kind of deceptive because in here are two major collections of works and there are, in the normal Protestant version of the Bible, 66 books. And then if you uh, have a Catholic friend, you look at their Bible, there's a whole section in there that Protestants don't typically do anything with called the Apocrypha, the other writings. And there's all kinds of books in there like Maccabees 1, 2, 3, 4, Tobit, uh, Bell and the Dragon, you know, that kind of stuff that um, you, if, you, if you look at the period of time that the scriptures are coming together, the Bible doesn't have everything that was written. It has pieces that have really stood out because of how they speak to the theme of this library, which is God and humanity. So, first thing, can I borrow yours for a second and show you? On your Bibles, I really strongly recommend the table of contents to you. It starts right there on page five. <clears throat> there's a lot of pages in here, and there's maps and all that sort of stuff. Uh, there's little articles in here that it says it's a Lutheran Bible, and uh, we'll talk about Luther later on. So there's articles and some color pictures there. Uh, but when you divide the Bible up, in this one they print the name of the particular book at the bottom of the page. Sometimes it's at the top of the page. And the table of contents just helps you to find your way around. And I want to show you roughly here All right, this much of your Bible is the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. The Jews don't call it that because they don't think there's a New Testament, otherwise they'd be Christians. This is the New Testament. So this is the stuff about Jesus and the early church. This is the stuff about Israel. So you can see that you know, the Old Testament's a pretty big chunk of the Bible. Now, within each of these major collections, you have individual books, and they're kind of uh, unusual in that some of the writing in these books is historical narrative. Some of it is speeches made by prophets and they might be just a couple of paragraphs so like if you look at the book of Jeremiah there's some story 
line, some narrative, but there's lots of individual prophecies. So Jeremiah lived a full life. He had a 20 or 30 career, year long career as a prophet, and he spoke about a lot of different issues. And he had a, a friend who was his secretary, uh, sometimes called a scribe named Baruch. And Baruch wrote everything down that he said and then collected it together afterward. So when you read the book of Jeremiah, um, it's like, what am I looking at? And it could be an individual prophecy or it could be Baruch filling in some narrative detail. And it's all in the one, quote, book of Jeremiah. One of the things that I'll try to encourage you to do is look at what you're reading and ask the question, you know, real simple question, what is this? Because if it's intended to be a historical narration of events, you read it one way. Kind of like in the newspaper, for example. If you go to the front page of the newspaper, you're expecting a news article. Like, you know, Dr. So-and-so in the Columbia Public Schools had a meeting and said X. And you expect it to be a truthful report of what happened at the meeting. If you turn to the section called the obituary, what are you going to find? Hopefully nothing about you, because that's where they have these little write-ups about people that have died recently. So when you read the obituary, you're expecting it to be a real short summation of a person's life. And when you realize that they're, they're literally paying by the word, you expect it to be short, because people want to get out a certain amount of information, and they don't want to pay a lot of money for it. Every once in a while, somebody will be considered to be important by their friends and family, and they'll write up a fairly long uh, synopsis of the person's life, all the things they did, and some of the important ideas that they had, and they're willing to pay for that. So if you see a really long obituary, you go, oh, somebody thought this guy was important, and, you know, go on. If you turn to the editorial, what are you going to find? It's not going to be news. What did you say? Something about yourself. Well, it, an editorial, like the, the way the newspaper is structured is there's reporters and then there's an editor for each of the major sections. And the editor, every once in a while, gets to write their opinion about what's going on. So, uh, what's his name, the superintendent of the schools? Um, Sandler? Strickler. 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 Mm -hmm. So, he's very controversial right now. Some people want him fired, some people want him kept. You've heard this? So, an editor of the Columbia newspaper might decide I'm going to weigh in on this and tell everybody what I think about Dr. Strickland. And it's not necessarily factual, though it should be, but it's mostly the editor's opinion on whatever the issue is. You see this on television. Uh, there's a difference between a newspaper, a news reporter for example, Channel 8, Caitlin Smith, you guys ever seen her? Pretty blonde, Channel 8. She's frequently, you know, like standing in the street and there's a building burning behind her. And she goes, there's a fire on the corner of 6th and Locust in Columbia. St. John's is burning to the ground and the flames are leaping up. She's giving you basic information. She would stop being a reporter and get into editorial if she said, and it's really a well-deserved fire because that pastor that they've got's a jerk. And you know, now she's into opinion. She might be right, but news editorial. Same thing in the Bible. You have historical narrative. You have a, an entire set of the lyrics of music. It's called the Book of Psalms. 
it's all to be set to music and song. It, it's the hymnal for the temple. And one of the people that writes those psalms is King David. So we, we have about David um, in the books of Samuel, we have the story of his life. And we know that he was the youngest son and we know that he used to be a shepherd and that he got pulled from being a shepherd and sent to take some food and clothing to his older brothers who were in the army. And so he went up there with these supplies. And when he got there, there's this giant from the Philistine city of Gath that come out every evening and say to the army of Israel, you know, your God's no good. And you guys are a bunch of cowards. And why don't you send somebody out to fight me? And David got his blood up about that. And so he said, I'll fight him. And everybody was like, you're just a kid, get out of here. You know, his older brothers are, go home, you know, that kind of thing. But David somehow or the other ends up going out against Goliath. And he was given the opportunity to wear the king's armor and fight with the king's weapons. And he said, ah, I'm not used to them. And so he goes out there in his normal clothes and he's got his slingshot that he uses when he's watching the sheep. And it's a long piece of leather with a little square area in the middle. And he would take rocks and hold the two ends of it together, swing it over his head and then let it go. And he could hit what he aimed at. Think about it, you're a shepherd. You're watching sheep eat all summer long. <laughs> Talk about boring. So what do you do? Well, David learned how to play the flute, the lyre, and got really good with a slingshot. And every once in a while, um, he talks about a bear one time attacked his flock, and he drove the bear off by, with his slingshot. Drove a lion off one time. So he was pretty good with this thing. And he went up against Goliath, and Goliath standing there, full armor, giant of a man, but what am I, a dog? You send this kid out after me, and blah, blah, blah. And while he's yelling and screaming, David's got this thing going. And he hits Goliath right between the eyes, knocks him out, falls over. David runs up, takes Goliath's sword, because David didn't have one, and cuts his head off. Holds it up in front of the two armies. And the Philistines are like, let's get out of here. And they ran away, and Israel won the battle. And there's a drawing of that event that is in the center of the flag of Virginia. And it says underneath it in Latin, six separatorantes, which means, may this always happen to tyrants. And it's the motto of the state of Virginia, because they know that story. So we know the story about David and Samuel, but we know some other things about David because we have the Psalms. So there, it's a combination of poetry and lyrics, just like our songs. So one of the things we know about David is the Lord, Yahweh, God of Israel, is my shepherd. I will not be in want. So it's a poem and a song and a prayer, and we have it. So we know about David from the narrative. We know what David thought from his own writings. And then we know what other people thought about David because later on, everybody keeps looking back to David saying, he's the great king. He's the one that I want to be like. So um, one of the things we know about David you might find interesting is after he killed Goliath, uh, the king, Saul, said, I want you to stay close to me. You're going to sit at my table, and he almost adopts him. David becomes best friends with Saul's oldest son, Jonathan, and he ends up marrying Saul's daughter, Micah. And she thought that he was pretty cool because he had long, flowing yellow hair, and he could play that lute, which was like a guitar, and sing. And whenever they went out to battle, when they came back, all the young girls and maidens in Israel were singing this song called Saul, the king, has killed thousands, 
but David has killed tens of thousands and Saul didn't like it. <laughs> and so his father-in-law got jealous of him. But um, we know a lot about him because of the different kinds of literature that's in the Bible. So when you go to read it, your first question needs to be, which testament am I in, old or new? What's, you know, what's the name of the book that gives me a clue? What am I looking at? Because you're gonna treat a poem differently than you are a historical narrative and differently than a prophetic utterance. So as you're reading this thing, you wanna know, what am I looking at? Now, does that make any sense? I, I, I would love to ask Aiden and Ella, because I gave him a little, I gave him a little task, if you remember. Other than putting your tabs in your Bibles, remember those Bible tabs? Um, remember, I, I showed you the book of Job? So, the <laughs> Least book of favorite. Job, I know, I know, it is, it's pretty small. But no, it's the, horrible. It, it is. <laughs> But, but with this, with this um, study Bible is what I was trying to okay. point out to them, that at the beginning of each, um, at the beginning of each book in the Bible, in these, in these special study Bibles, it's really cool because, gosh, when I was your age and I opened the Bible, I like felt like drooling, like, where, how do I read this? You know, what do I do? But at the beginning of each one of the books in this study Bible, it actually gives you suggestions on how to read the book. And it gives you, like here in the book of Job, it tells you a background of if they know the author or if they don't know the author. Now, did you happen to open it up and look at it? It's okay if you didn't. Look at what? Uh, the book of Job. You Your know, homework. I just didn't remember, right? Okay, and it's okay. I, I just was doing that to see if, if you guys would really be um, interested in looking. But if it's on page 7 to 88 in, in this Bible in the, is the book of Job. But it actually tells you um, a way to read it. And this is really weird. It's not my favorite either. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the book of Job is so small. But this tells you to read chapters 1 and 2 and then skip the whole middle, and then read the end. Does that sound weird to you? Because usually when you open a book, you start at the beginning, and you read it through, and you finish it at the end. Well, the whole middle of the book of Job is strange. Yes. And it's like, it's like this big Shakespeare play. And they say weird things. I don't know. That's my opinion. But it, it, but if you read the beginning of the book of Job, and then you read the end of it, the middle is like, like opinions, kind of. Um, so a bunch when, of bad stuff happens to Job, and his friends yeah. come to tell him it's your fault. Yeah, they're, it's yeah. So, so one thing when you when you're by yourself with this Bible on your lap in your room kind of look at, re review, review those things there that tells you how to read it. Whether you read it or not, that's up to you. But it's really interesting what they write at the beginning because this is a study Bible and I learn a lot from, from, from this study Bible. It has some really neat stuff in it. So that's pretty much all I wanted yeah. to, to kind of interject with them. Now I will bring you guys uh, next time we meet a chart that has a timeline across the top of history and then roughly by century where each of the books of the Bible fit in and that will help. Um, but what she was saying about the study Bible is they, they have those introductory pages for each book and then another thing that you'll see, or yours for a second, is down um, along the side, mm -hmm. you'll have, it'll be tied to the chapter and verse numbers. It'll tell you 
interesting little things to help make the text more understandable. And uh, when it's important to do so, there'll be maps in there and charts and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And the, the thing that I'd encourage you to do is just take the Bible and sit there and just kind of thumb through it until you see what you, what you have in your hands. My dad used to, he was kind of snarky, used to say, the Bible, the most published, least read book in the history of the world. And what he was getting at was, there's a lot of people that say all kinds of nice things about the Bible because they think they're supposed to, but it's not gonna do you any good if you don't read it. And what you'll find when you read it is stories about human beings and their relationship with God. And it kind of works out. There's a, there's a big story in there about God and what God's doing for us. And here, the second big point. First one is it's a library. The second big point is there is an overarching, what the, your English teacher will call a narrative arc. There's a beginning, a middle, and a climax, and then it points to where it's all going at the very end. But the point of this story, and this is purely a Christian perspective, is that all of it points to Jesus, okay? All of it points to Jesus. So when we read the Old Testament, and for example, right at the beginning of the first book, there's a story of Adam and Eve, and they get kicked out of the garden for disobeying God, and there's a God saying some things, and one of the things he says to Eve is that, um, one of your descendants and this loose, this uh, serpent are gonna contend with one another and he's gonna strike at the heel of this person and this person is gonna crush his head with his heel. And Christians over the last couple thousand years have seen that as probably the very first hint that what, what is God gonna do about the brokenness in the world brought on by human beings? And the answer is, there's going to be a child of Eve who is going to be God's redeemer. And it's the first pointing of it in the scriptures. When we read it as Christians, it's like, yeah, it's obvious as the nose on my face. Non-Christians look at it and they go, well, I don't, I don't see that. So it, it's a faith thing. So it's a library, talks about God and humanity, and the central character and where all the action's going is Jesus. Yes. All right. And now, we're collecting cereal boxes. Yes. We're just about to come to that. Good. There's a structure here. So if you would take your table of contents, I'll try to talk you through it. The Old Testament is divided into books, but there's three big headings in the Old Testament. And when Jews like Jesus want to talk about the whole Old Testament, they'll talk about the law and the prophets and the writings. So the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are what the Jews call the Torah. Sometimes Torah is translated as law, but it that's not really quite right. It's more uh, the instruction of God. Like if your grandfather was telling you something that he thought you needed to know, it would be probably more than you wanted in the moment, but it would be from someone that loves you, cares about you, and wants the best for you, and so forth. For the Jews, the Torah is the core to the whole thing. And they actually even treat it as one book, okay? So Torah is a grouping. 
A second grouping is called the, the prophets. And the Hebrew word for prophet is nabi. And so they talk about the nabaim. Anytime you see I am, it's plural. And that um, is all the ones you would expect, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so forth. They're prophets. They're people that stand up and speak truth to power. And then the third grouping is all the other stuff. And that's called the ketovim. So there, it's uh, the other writings, and it includes Psalms and Proverbs. And now the words that you're saying in a different language, what, is that Hebrew? That's Hebrew. So the Old Testament is almost all in Hebrew, except Daniel, which has Greek and is a, a sort of a street version of Hebrew called Aramaic. Yeah, like... Well, you know, if you've ever been in New York, you know, the, there's a big Jewish population in New York City, and some of them speak Yiddish, which is Slavic and Hebrew. Combined. And there was a movie called uh, Spanglish. Did you guys see that? Oh, yeah. Kind of a jamming Spanish and English together, it's apparently. A, it's a funny movie, actually. Yeah, it's a good, good it show. It is a good movie. But that kind of jamming today. languages together thing, Aramaic's mm -hmm. one of those kind of languages. So your Old Testament, three parts. Now, Teresa was just saying about uh, cereal boxes. What we're going to do is make a model of the Bible where each book is a color-coded cereal box. So there's an art project that needs done. So how many cereal boxes do we need if we're doing the whole Bible? And well, I know you know the answer because we said it last week. Okay, what? Sixty. Oh, close. You guys know this? No, that's too high. She was too low. Sixty-six. Sixty-six. Yeah. So. Y'all need to get hot on eating cereal yeah. that comes in boxes. <laughs> Don't throw the box away. Yeah, just eat all the stale cereal. Ew. Nobody actually does that. If you do, no, you cereal never gets stale in my house when we eat it too quickly. And remember, real cereal comes in aluminum foil. <laughs> None of this wax paper stuff. So. Bible is a library. The central character of the library and what all of it's ultimately all about is Jesus. There's 66 books. The Old Testament has three divisions, Torah, well, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. The New Testament is a little bit different. Um, the equivalent of Torah in the New Testament is the Gospels. How many Gospels are there? Four, okay. Three of them are really closely related, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, we'll get into this later, but they think that Mark is the oldest, and because when you look at Matthew and Luke, they re reproduce about 90% of Mark, but they fix his spelling and his grammar, and then they add stuff to it. So scholars go, well, this must have been first, and then even Luke even says, you know, other people have tried to write Gospels, but I don't think they did very well, so here's my version. And so those three look a lot alike. Here's a fancy word. Uh, synoptic, same, you know, vision, same view. The Gospel of John, they're not quite sure what to do with because some of the stuff in John is really, really like this guy was with Jesus when this happened, no doubt about it. He knows Jerusalem really, really well. And then there's other material that's very 
theological that's been added to it, and they're trying to figure out, okay, how did this come together? So John's a little bit different. There is a book right after the Gospels in the New Testament called the Acts of the Apostles, sometimes just called Acts, A-C-T-S. One of my professors said it should be called Some of the Acts of a Couple of the Apostles because it really only focuses in on first half Peter, second half Paul. Guess who the author of Acts is? Luke. So you could literally pull the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts, and it's part one and part two, the same work by the same guy, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Most of the rest of the New Testament after Acts is a bunch of letters, some of them by a guy named Paul, who his given name was Saul, and he was from a city in southeastern Turkey called Tarsus. He was a Jew. His dad was rich enough to send him to Jerusalem, like sending him off to college, and he studied with the very best rabbis. And he started out hating Christians. He thought that what they were saying was blasphemy. And so uh, he hated them so much that he got a bunch of his friends together and they grabbed this one Christian named Stephen and they tried him, found him guilty of blasphemy, dragged him outside the city, threw him in a ditch and threw rocks at him until he was dead. That's how much Saul hated Christians. He killed Stephen, first Christian to die for his faith. Saul arrested Christians, threw them in jail, sold all their property, and he was like the scourge of the church in Jerusalem and then the surrounding area of Judea. And the chief priest gave him documents and sent him to Damascus to keep it up because some of the Christians had fled there. And so Saul and his little gang were going up to Damascus to get Christians. And guess what happened to him? This is three years after Jesus rose from the dead. The road to yeah. Damascus. You'll see this, it's, it's a very famous event. Saul's beating feet down the road, heading to Damascus, and then all of a sudden there's this great blinding light that goes, boom, and he's on the ground. And this voice says to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He goes, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus. And sure as shooting, the resurrected Jesus was standing right there over the top of him. And he goes, you're blind. You're going to be led into Damascus. And my man uh, is going to come and talk to you. So Saul is like, laying there and his friends pick him up and they take him in and they take him to the house where they were going and a guy named Anachias is Christian living in Damascus and um, Jesus shows up and says I have something for you to do and I want you to go to this house you'll find Saul of Tarsus and Anachias goes ah, Lord perhaps you haven't heard I love that He's bad juju. We don't want to do it in Jesus' go. So Anachias walks into the house, and he goes into the room where Saul is blind and fasting and praying, and he starts out, Brother Saul, this is a guy who has been killing Christians, arresting them, throwing them in prison, selling all their property out from underneath them, and he walks in and he says, Brother Saul, and so Saul hears the gospel, he repents, and he's baptized, and then the scales fall off of his eyes and he can see again. And then he starts preaching Jesus instead of hunting Christians. And Saul will go almost 30 years 
and he will be uh, taken to Rome as a prisoner and have his head cut off for being a person that talked about Jesus. So we have letters from him. He did a lot of looping trips around the eastern end of the Mediterranean and started churches. We read all about him in the second half of the Book of Acts. Uh, we have a couple of letters from Simon Peter, who was a fisherman that Jesus took on as a disciple and as his number one guy. And Simon Peter has two letters. He died in Rome at the same time as Paul. Uh, there's some letters from another apostle named John, who uh, either wrote or is profoundly connected to the Gospel of John. We have three letters of his. Um, he's the only one of the apostles that wasn't martyred. He died of old age in Ephesus, but we have letters from him. The New Testament ends with this really weird book called Revelation, and there's a, he's a priest of the church. His name is John, it's a very common name. And he was put in prison on an island in the Eastern Mediterranean, Aegean Sea area called Patmos. And one day he was praying and he had a vision. And the vision was Jesus revealing to him how all of human history will come to an end. So if you want to know about what's coming, there's that book for you. So two different testaments, different groups, total of 66, we call them canonical, means the standard, like a ruler. Um, you measure, say these are the books that we read and worship to measure uh, what's good for Christians to be reading to build up their faith. And we're going to make a big bookshelf, and each book is going to be a box of cereal mm -hmm. that you all are yeah. going to eat. So that works out to about 20 boxes of cereal each between now and two weeks, right? Ah, uh, we can do it. We can do it, right? Well, you, I'm sure you have friends or somebody that eats Get your friends to save cereal boxes for you. I'm asking the younger kids to save them too for you. So, do you have any questions? Real quick and dirty over your what you've got in your hands. Your homework is find some time and just sit there and flip through the book. See what's in there. And for those of you who do not have your Bible tabs in, like this one here has the Bible tabs. I gave you the Bible tabs. Put them in for next time. It'll help you get to a book quicker. Yeah, it really will. Yeah. And there's some weird stuff in there too, like the books are arranged by length rather than time, which makes it weird. Yeah. So. And does anyone, last, last time, Aiden prayed us out. Would you like to do it again? Or somebody else want to pray us out? You'll Is do it again? Is that Taylor volunteering to pray? Probably not. You better pay attention. <laughs> Is that a yes? You don't want to do it? Does anybody want to pray us out? All right. Say it loud. Do you want to, do you want to come up here and do it? Or you want to do it from there? Okay, stand up so we can hear you. Dear God, it's, thank you, it's over. There, yeah, there is no right or wrong to prayer. Just I send us on our way and thank for We want to hear you, just say it now. Dear God, I hope everyone has like a good week and stays healthy. Amen. 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 Perfect. Thank you.